The goal of this workshop is to introduce you to the most commonly used um, an analysis method for functional MRI data. Um, we have different labs that use functional MRI and fight over the right way to analyze data, but all of the labs use this method to start analyzing the data. Um, and what I'm going to show you today is how we analyze data from a single participant. Nancy will talk a lot about how to combine data across participants, because that's where labs and scientists differ. Um, and, and the goal here is twofold. First is to give you a theoretical understanding of the principles of this method. So it's going to be more about theory and intuitive understanding of the theory and less about formulas because we have software to do all the formulas for us. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of PhD students and postdocs don't really understand the theoretical foundations of this. So my goal is that if you ever do this, you understand what it means. Um, and the second is to, to uh, to help you implement this into a very simple MATLAB code. So by the end of this workshop, you're going to have a very, very simplified MATLAB code that completely analyzes data from an experiment from a single participant. Uh, most of the data we're going to work with is an actual data of someone's brain that we scanned a few years ago. Uh, sometimes I, I, I'll give you mock data, and that's only in cases when I want to show you signals that behave very, very nicely and have very little noise, and you don't see that in brain data, so I make, sometimes I make signals up. Um, but I'll tell you when I do that. Um, I haven't introduced myself so far, so for those of you who don't know me, which is I think half of you, I'm Idan, I'm a PhD student with uh, Nancy and Eva Fedorenko. I study language processing, which is uh, what we'll do today as our study case, um, or as our, uh, yeah, and that's it. I'm a fifth, I'm a fifth year, um, and I've developed this specifically for people with very little background in fMRI, so I think it's very fitting to do this for your second class. Okay, um, so in order for this not to be boring and me just talking about theory, we're going to take um, a question that we're going to investigate throughout the workshop. And the question we're going to investigate is, uh, what, la what regions in your brain are engaged during language processing? Um, and Nancy already told you that the where question, the question of localization, is not really the most interesting question. Um, but this is a first step. So the first step we're going to do today is ask where in your brain are the regions that respond or that get engaged during language processing? Of course, the really interesting questions are questions you can ask once you've found these regions. Questions like, are these regions doing only language? Are they domain specific? Or are they doing many other stuff as well? What kind of representations are held in these regions? What kind of algorithms or operations are being carried out by these regions? These are the cognitive questions that really interest us. But in order to study all of these questions, first we need to find where in the brain are the regions we're interested in. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, so in order to do this, we're going to come up with a simple experiment. You three already know this experiment. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is we just want to give our participants some sort of language task um, to make their brain engage with some sort of linguistic input. Um, so we're going to uh, show them a sentence on a screen that is presented word by word, and we're just going to tell them, read the sentence. So the experiment for them is going to look something like this. OK? And they see many, many sentences, and they read them. And then we can ask, what regions of your brain increase their activity in response to sentences? And that sounds like maybe a reasonable first pass at finding the language system in your brain, or the regions in your brain that are engaged during language processing. So let's see what happens when we do that. We find many, many, many regions. This is from one participant. And the problem is that we find many regions we do care about, but also many regions we don't really care about. So for example, the regions there at the back of the brain. So um, this is a brain from a side view. So if you just open my scalp and take this part out, that's what you'll see. The eyes are here. At the back of the brain, you see lots of activations. This is the visual cortex. And it's active because when you read sentences, there is something on the screen. Your visual cortex really couldn't care less whether it's letters or faces or scenes or bodies or just line drawings. Um, and we know that this is not part of your language system. So we don't really care about that region. So I kind of want to throw that out. We also get some other regions that are active just because there is some task. So there are regions from a system that we call the cognitive control system or the attention system. These are regions that are uh, uh, 
somehow involved with fluid intelligence. So whenever you're trying to solve some task, whether it's reading or doing arithmetic or playing a memory game or anything else, these regions are activated as well. And these two are not part of your language system, but we get them here because all I asked was what regions of your brain increase, increase their activity in response to sentences. So that's not a very good question, and you already know from Nancy that with fMRI, um, the meaningful questions are questions that compare two conditions. Just asking about increasing activity to sentences is not a very good question. We need to find some sort of control condition and ask what regions of your brain increase the response to sentences more than they increase the response to some other control condition. And this control condition hopefully will help us wash out all the regions we're not really interested in. So regions we're not really interested in should activate this to the same extent for both of these conditions. So when we compare these conditions, these regions don't show any differentiation, and we, we won't find them. And the question is, what will our control condition be? You know this. Um, so give me some suggestions. Yes? Nonsense words. Nonsense words. OK, good. Why is that good? Good. OK, so if we read nonsense words, so things that could be words but are not really words, like blicket and florp, there's, there is something on the screen. So we'll get the visual cortex. Not only there is something on the screen, there are letters. So if there are regions that just care about letters but don't really care about deep understanding of language, we'll wash them out too. So that's good. It's a task, and we need a task, because we want to wash all that cognitive control attentional system out. So Reading, in both cases, you do reading, so that's good. Um, what don't we have in nonsense words that we do have in sentences? What, what are the differences? Yes? Right. So there is no, so we call that syntax or grammar, right? The way that words in a sentence relate to each other. So there's a verb, and there's a, the verb has a subject and an object. Nonsense words don't, ha don't have that. What else? Yes? Right, so when you see a sentence, you construct a meaning from one word to the next. We call this compositional semantics. Semantics is the study of meaning in language, and it's compositional because it's composed of the single words together into a, a, a bigger meaning. So sentences have compositional semantics, but nonsense words don't have them. That's good. Um, and also, the most basic thing is the meaning of individual words. Right? Sentences have that. Each individual word has a meaning. Nonsense words don't have meanings. So if we're going to compare these two conditions, what we're going to pull out, hopefully, is the brain regions that care about meanings of individual words, about syntax, and about compositional semantics, uh, the way you construct a big meaning out of its components. So here is how reading non-words look like. OK, I can do this again. Um, and we let subjects read sometimes sentences, sometimes non-words, and we compare the activations in the brain in these two conditions. OK, we did this already. So here's what our experiment looks like. S the participant is lying in the scanner, and they see things flashing up on the screen. And all we tell them to do is to read the things and try not to fall asleep. Um, and what I'm showing here is when the subject or the participant is reading sentences in red, and when they're reading non-words in blue, over time. So the x-axis is time. And on the y-axis, whenever you see a bump, that means that during this time, they're reading sentences. And during this time, they're reading non-words. OK? And we scan them with our uh, functional MRI while they're doing it. And every two seconds, we take a picture of their entire brain. So each black tick mark is an acquisition of an entire volume of their brain. OK, so the first tick, tick mark is a bunch of slices that cover the entire brain. There are many more than four. I'm just showing four here. And then we do the same for the second time point. And then for every time point, we get this picture of the brain. And of course, it slices because we can't take a 3D picture all at once. So we, we only know how to take 2D pictures. So we take a 2D picture, and then another one, and then another one, and then another one. OK. And this stack of 2D pictures, or stack of slices, we call that a volume. Um, so a volume is a 3D picture of the brain. So you can think of it as a picture with depth, because we have three, uh, three dimensions. Um, and each slice is built from 
if, if we're, we're talking just about 2D slices, like any picture, they're built from pixels, right? Pixel is the smallest unit of an image, um, and you can see them here. But in brain images, because we have three dimensions, we don't call them pixels, we call them voxels. So a voxel is a volume pixel. It's like a 3D pixel. So the smallest unit that we have is a voxel, so I'm just going to say that word a lot. Um, so these are our voxels. So the voxel is the building block of a volume. Um, it's a cube, and usually its size is between one cube millimeter and eight cube millimeters. Um, and our functional data, these data that we acquired, um, is a series of volume collected over time. So you can think of this as a movie. We have a 3D picture, and then another 3D picture, and then another 3D picture. picture. So it's like a 3D movie, um, where we can see how the brain signals change over time. Okay, um, and then we also get for each subject, and that's just so you know, even though we don't really analyze it, we get anatomical data. So this is just one still picture, one 3D picture of their brain, and it's just much more detailed. Um, and this is just to see the structure of their brain, uh, and it, help us, it helps us during some stages that we won't talk about today, but just so you know, we do that whenever we run an fMRI experiment. Okay, in MATLAB, a volume is going to be a 3D matrix, and each entry in the matrix is going to be the signal fr recorded from a, a single voxel at some point in time, or uh, in that volume. So just as a volume is a stack of, of 2D slices, a 3D matrix is a stack of 2D matrices, one behind the other, or one of top, on top of the other. A voxel is going to be a single entry in that matrix, so each voxel has an address with an X, Y, and Z coordinates. Anatomical data are going to be one single 3D matrix, so it's one 3D picture, and the functional data are going to be a four-dimensional matrix. So imagine taking a three-dimensional matrix and then adding a fourth dimension, so we have another three-dimensional matrix, another three-dimensional matrix, another three-dimensional matrix. Um, so it's like a movie of 3D matrices. Okay. Um, because this is a 4D matrix, every entry here has an address of four numbers, X, Y, Z, and time. Um, and the entry X, Y, Z, T stores the signal from voxel X, Y, Z that we recorded at time T. Does that make sense? Awesome. Okay. Um, so the first thing I want you to do, you have three exercises just to explore um, brain data a little bit, get a sense of what they look like. Um, so go to exercises one through three. And the way this website is designed is that most of what I say is also written there in case you forget or you didn't understand and you want to read it again. But you don't have to read it. You can go straight to the exercises and just do them. Um, so there is this. And then uh, first of all, you're just going to look at anatomical images and functional images. And then you're going to extract the signal time series from different voxels, so the signal and how we change it across time. Um, so I'll go around and help you. You can help each other. You can talk to each other. Um, and then once all of you or most of you are done, we'll continue.